You're listening to the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast, the show that blends science and heart to bring you evidence-based tips and tricks for cultivating a healthy, wealthy, and meaningful life. Now, here's your host, therapist, yogi, and fellow full life balancer, Dr. Caitlin Harkis. Hi there, welcome to Wisdom for Wellbeing. If we have not already met before, my name is Dr. Caitlin Harkis, and I am excited to be dropping into your earbuds today. And actually, after today's interview, I think that I now more than ever appreciate how sacred this connection is. You know, this opportunity to connect, to use voice, and to share inspiration. We have not talked specifically about voice before, and today we are hearing from Dr. Louise Maller, who has won the Speaker of the Year Award. She's essentially an award-winning body language and communication expert. You are going to hear about how you can use your body your voice to massage other individuals. Now, this might sound a little bit weird, but let me explain more. Louise is going to talk us through how language, how voice can convey in a very visceral felt sense. In fact, if you listen this interview through to the end, I have no doubt that you're going to have this sacred sense of voice, of sound, of how we resonate with others. So let me share a little bit about Louise. Now, Louise moved from the Vienna State Opera back to Australia and noticed there was this missing ingredient in corporate leadership. She completed then an award-winning PhD around using the unsung wisdom of the mind-body-voice connection, and she named this vocal intelligence. She appears on TV and radio for her work on presence and influencing for senior leaders in high-stakes engagement. Having worked with Fortune 500 clients, including BHP, IBM, Adobe, and after a lifetime of being a communication expert, Dr. Louise Malner introduces you to new ways to engage and communicate in business. I am so excited for this episode. In all honesty, you know, I wasn't sure exactly what to expect. However, I highly, highly, highly recommend that, you know, listen to it now, but get on to YouTube. You know, we've got a YouTube channel there and you can actually see Louise using her body to communicate, to resonate. It adds another layer. So I recommend it. Of course, audio, we talk through anything that you can't see here. So you're not going to miss anything, but I definitely believe that there is something to be gained. One other thing I'll draw your attention to, and you'll no doubt hear at the end, um, Louise has a puppet that she introduces you to. Now, her puppet is this challenging side of her, and she talks about how she acknowledges it, recognizes it, and you're just not serving me right now. This is acceptance and commitment therapy in action, isn't it? This is the diffusion skills that I am so passionate about, and I love to see Louise's visual representation of this part of ourself, you know, our mean mind, you know, our protective mind, this part that has all these messages that may or may not communicate at the optimal time. But without further ado, let's dive in. Let's hear from Louise now. Louise, welcome to Wisdom for Wellbeing. I am so excited to be with you here today and to be sitting down in amongst pandemic tech issues and the like. So thank you for creating the space to be here. Thank you for having me. It's a delight. And we are talking about something that we haven't talked about on Wisdom for Wellbeing before. We are specifically talking about body language, communication, voice, you know, what you describe as mind-body voice connection. And this is something you wrote an award-winning dissertation on. You know, you've written a beautiful book on resonance. For Mm. listeners who are not familiar with your work, would you mind just sharing a little bit about who you are? Mm. Uh, Well, my background has two sides. One is I actually am in business. I work with leaders in business. But the other side is I sang opera and I kind of put those performance skills together for people in business. And having said that, I do it in in an unusual way. You know, people see me on TV, they see me analysing people. 
and they'll think, oh, that's what she does. She analyzes. Well, you know, there's more. And the more is that I look at that from a body language perspective and uh, top 30 body language people in the world. And I look at how people perceive you because that is what body language means. It is the perception of others. But actually my fascination in analyzing people is not just the body language. It's why we do what I do we do to express ourselves from a health point of view, from a mental point of view, from the fact that we are presenting our authentic self. So really looking at it from these two very different angles. And then the follow-up step is that I work on the skills to actually do something about it, to actually make a difference. And funnily enough, that's not as simple as it sounds because sometimes You have to come at things from a different angle to make change with the unconscious mind because the problem here is the unconscious mind. That's the one we're dealing with most of the time. Could you give me an example of what you mean by the unconscious mind and how that impacts our communication, you know, our body language? How how would we see that playing out? I can give you a million ideas. So, uh, for instance, (laughs) in our voice, You know, the word anxiety actually comes from the verb to strangle. So as a consequence, when we are under stress, um, people will say, sorry, you know, we start, our throat starts closing and we have a response. That is the unconscious mind at play. Um, And, but we can override it with the conscious mind. So we have to understand how the unconscious mind is affecting us and then override it. What a lot of people listening will do if they think about it is the minute they get in front of groups, they'll close over their body and they'll clench their fists. People have clenched fists almost all the time. I believe that when we clench our fists, we actually can't breathe. Um, And we don't realize that if we open the hands, suddenly we become much freer in our body and our communication. And we didn't mean to close our fists, but we do. That's incredible. So, it's the so only just mind we have to understand. Yeah, and how it then has this physical imprint and impact, you know, I guess this is part of the connection. So there's the physical, you described, you know, the clenching of the fists and how with anxiety, you know, our throat closes over and that knowing what's kind of sitting underneath is really important. I'm I'm keen to come back and dive into this because I have no doubt that there's going to be many listeners going, how can you, for instance, you know, speak in public or communicate your ideas without anxiety, which I know is an area you work on and supporting individuals here, but like who, who is this work important for? Because, you know, you were obviously, um, well, I shouldn't say obviously, you were, congratulations, voted the 2021 Keynote Speaker of the Year. You know, this is your jam, keynotes, you know, communication with business leaders, as you said, instruction. You're in the public forum a lot. And there may be people listening who are leaders and who might do keynotes themselves, but others may not be. And yet I believe that this is an important conversation for others to be listening to. Where where would we see in our lives the role of communication? Oh, uh, it's everyone, everywhere, whether you are someone sleeping on the street looking for a job or um, a leader, it is across the board for everybody who exists. This is important personal development. And, you know, when I'm queen, everyone will do the work. Um, However, how do you have the biggest impact? And I think you get the biggest impact by actually working with people who lead others because a fish Mm -hmm. rots from the head. So I love to work with people who lead others. I get my biggest bang by working in that way. And, uh, and you know, I also get my biggest bang from not working with captives, but people who are ready to make that impact, who are ready to say, Louise, tell me what to do and I will do it. And we can make fast change. Incredible, incredible. And uh, what a beautiful analogy of how the fish rots too, right? That leaders, you know, pa- pass down to the individuals that they're guiding, supporting, and that is the role of a leader, right? To go ahead. So with this, you know, for leaders, visionaries, individuals who might want to pitch an idea at work and kind of steer a conversation there differently and lead in that direction, what mistakes might these individuals be making right now? You know, what might be 
a common challenge in terms of communication. I could talk about this for the next three weeks and I'll just run through, you know, I'll just start at the very beginning because the minute we begin to see a stressful situation, people who aren't accustomed to performance will alter their breath. So, for instance, they will take their breath high, that's very common, or lock their head into the body or lock their arms onto the side of their body. And so we'll often get people greeting others by walking to the middle of the room and saying, good morning, everyone, and good morning, everyone, closing down, where in fact the reality is that when you greet people, you open up. Good morning, everyone. It is an opening gesture, not a closing gesture. So having done that, um, we then, uh, we think we have to stand still. Now, the body freezes. We need to move. So where are you going to move? Why are you going to move? What's the anchoring of that movement? So we need to think about the body and its movement. We need to start using the hands effectively. Hands guide breath flow. So what are your hands doing? And uh, initiating sound. Ah, you know, that's how you initiate sound. And people tend to go, hello, hello, you know. Uh, we do ridiculous things to initiate sound. So there is a mountain of things that can go wrong for people and we're not aware because we don't analyse all of those things that build up, build up, build up and block us down in communication. And, and this is your jam, isn't it? Like the analyzing first, how did you get into this? You know, where did you, uh, obviously, you know, your opera background, which we hear coming through in your voice so beautifully, you know, you would have had an awareness of voice, yeah. but is, is this where your interest in body language started or how did this unfold? Yeah, great question. Well, I sang, I sang opera and I was in Vienna. And when I was in Vienna, I had a fabulous opportunity to work for people who were top of their game in the world in in the singing field and also the people who worked with those people and in particular somebody called Professor Ellen Müller-Price who is not known here but she had a state funeral in Vienna. Why? Because she was a gold medalist fencer um, in the Olympics. Over 24 years she competed at Olympics and uh, I met her and became her protégé really and travel with her and around for 12 years doing master classes and we did those master classes mostly for actors and singers and the whole point of it was to analyze where the stresses were in the body to get sound out in a better way you know what sort of an apprenticeship could you better apprenticeship could you have than doing that for 12 years with someone who was an olympic sports person in body balance and attack and um you know she also had studied medicine so when I came into business, of course, you know, we were looking at someone who maybe could lift their palate further or just get a little bit more space. When I come into business and people who are completely, this is alien to them, you know, are like, oh, they're doing really weird things. It's very easy to analyse, let me tell you. Um, yeah. So I have this different pair of glasses that I see through because of an unusual background. That's incredible. And how, how beautiful. Um, the the Oh, no, go ahead. And Professor Miller Price was actually, she actually had worked with Alexander Feldenkrais, and you know these are body people as well, and um, you know so it's all through that school of thought. It seems like a, a perfect connection, you know the the body skill that she would obviously um, have and have you know cultivated and honed over over her you know very high level training, elite training. And then yours, essentially, you know, you're doing elite level um, athletics, but in the opera space, because it's with your voice, you know, it's very elite level, yeah. you know, and in Vienna of all places. So it seems like the perfect merger. And I imagine both of you were integrating skills and frames and that understanding that voice is connected to body, <laughs> body is connected to mind mm -hmm. and the like. So when you described anxiety earlier, knowing that public speaking is um, a fate that some individuals would, you know, put put as scarier than death, <laughs> how would you approach that level of anxiety that someone might feel when they're going to to speak in a public forum? You know, from five people to a hundred people, how do you address that? 
Well, I've studied performance anxiety a lot and I myself has ha have had it, worst case scenario, since I was five years old and work through it every day. So I love helping people with it. And, I, you know, I understand the different stages of catastrophization well before an event, panic at an event and rumination after an event. And I guess the major area that people suffer with is panic. And one of my favourite case studies was a fellow I worked with and he came into the room and it was a Thursday. I remember it so strongly. It was a Thursday. And he was so panicked and he started to do this. And I thought, he's going to blow up. And then I said to him, when is this presentation? And he said, Tuesday. And I said, where is it? And he said, London. I said, okay, it's Thursday now. We've got till Tuesday and you have to get to London. Right. Well, that's kind of an exaggerated what I'm getting all the time. And what I find is that the classic way of dealing with any performance anxiety is to go back and explore the mind. I don't have time. I don't have time to say to someone who's in a panic attack, tell me about your relationship with your family and your mother. And you, I don't have time. I actually have to analyze how the, the mind is affecting the body and I'll see where it's impacting in the body. And then I can undo those stresses. Funnily enough, it will go back and affect the mind and help people be more confident. At the same time, when you release the body, it in turn releases the voice. So you can hear the results in the voice, um, work on the body, it goes back to the mind, and you'll hear it in the voice. And it's a fast track. That's incredible. And I think so powerful, isn't it? That, you know, there's, there's so many ways in and working as a therapist myself, where a lot of the time I am asking, you know, tell me about, tell me about childhood and the like, you know, that there's yeah. another way in that there's a body based practice as well. And we know through like hosts and hosts of research that if we change our physical positioning, we actually change our emotional state. So perhaps not surprising mm -hmm. that our voice changes with that you know and I, I guess I'm wondering yeah. you know in your work you kind of it sounds like are at a very sophisticated level identifying areas of tension or where there could be release is there anything else that you do like are there common patterns common um, positions that people are maybe using that are suboptimal Yes. Well, it's all about blockage. But, you know, my favorite phrase in this area is that vocal dynamics echo psychodynamics through the middleman of the body. And uh, likewise, um, psychodynamics echo vocal dynamics. You know, it works both ways, uh, you know, all the time you're working. Um, what do people do? People do very odd things with their voice. And it comes from just patterns we built up over the years, patterns of stress that we accept and feel comfortable with. So we no longer realize that what we're doing is not necessarily natural, but habitual. And that's the first thing people have to realize that they're habitual skills. Um, that we have and therefore are changeable. And we need to get rid of the word natural. Um, get rid of it. Everything is changeable and work through a change plan. So you'll be looking at your eyes. You'll be looking at what you do with your face. You'll be looking at where you put your head. You'll be looking at how you hold your body. What is your power strategy? Because for many people, they will use their head as their power strategy. No, no, and they use the head. That is not a viable power strategy. Um, instead, you use your lower body. And it doesn't matter if you're a horse rider, a rower, um, you know, a swimmer, whatever you do, power is in the lower body. But when we come to speaking, we forget all of that and we start to use our head. And and it's it's ridiculous. Um, and we're never taught it. It's not raised to our awareness. So first of all, it's perceived as something that looks really stupid. But second of all, it's actually not good for you. You know, it's killing you to do these strategies. You'll hurt your neck, um, unable to breathe. It'll shorten your life apart from anything else. And it's not rewarding. 
Yeah. I'm passionate about gestures. And in the business world, there is, to put it politely, bugger all research in this area, is that um, we all know through voice that hands guide airflow. You know, blah, 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 actually, you have you any wall? You get to the end of the phrase. You'll see it, all singers do it. Well, is it any different in singing or speaking? You know, there are two theories of voice. One is that we're born speaking and we expand that out, how difficult, into singing. No, actually the reality is we began singing and we've squashed that down into speaking. Um, and if you realise that you were born with this huge capacity, uh, then you know, you're going to realize that you have a massive expanse of vocal repertoire. And to get that out, you need your hands. The question is, how do you use those hands? You don't um, just wave them around. Uh, you actually use them congruently. They have meaning. So we have to learn where congruent gestures go, um, when we use them, how big they are, what we do with our gestures. Very. You have me wanting to bring my hands up onto the screen just in this conversation and watching you use your body so beautifully. So listeners who maybe are normally um, audio listeners, I would recommend for this episode that you jump onto YouTube and you you actually watch this and of course head to Louise's um, Louise's website where you can see you know many many videos and you know you in action speaking formally. So listeners who you know have been who haven't had this information provided before, you know, forgiving ourselves for what we didn't know before we learned it. And they're kind of now going, okay, so there are some things I can do to enhance the quality of my voice, to um, ensure that I'm using my body language optimally. It has to do with my hands, you know, letting go of the fists that you described that are so common when we're anxious, when we're constricted, you know, opening our hands up, sort of putting the power into our lower bodies. And they're starting to kind of move into this area. I know that breath is something you talk a lot about here as well. Do you have a couple of breath tips that you could offer listeners to start to bring in? I do. Yeah. So let me ask people who are listening, do you speak on the breath out or do you speak on the breath in? Now, what's fascinating is that many people have to think about it. They have to think about it. How could we be so unaware to have to think about it? Let me tell you, there's only one answer. We speak on the breath out. Um, you can't speak on the breath in. Well, you can, but, you know, it's not very effective. So um, we speak on the breath out. So the breath out is critically important. All the sound is is breath that has been broken up into waves. So air comes out of your body. That is sound. We cut it into a frequency with our vocal folds. So breath and voice are the same thing, just how you've cut them up. Ah, ah. You know, we go faster for high notes, we go slower for low notes, and the vocal folds stretch long and thin for high notes, short and fat for low notes. Singers get paid more who sing high notes than singers who, who sing low notes because there's more stress in the body. And uh, so voice is breath. So you've got to be able to manage that breath. And we know, for instance, that singers' rule number one is that if any breath comes into the upper body, I'm going to go into that anxiety because it's going to engage these muscles around the neck and strangle me. The vocal folds hang loose in the neck. They're not attached to anything. But if these areas around clamp, they clamp the vocal folds and they can't move. They can't stretch, bend, tip that they need to do. So we must keep the breath down. The second thing is that it, well, the voice won't work, but um, is that you'll actually look tense if you breathe high. And even worse is that, when we breathe high, we get 20% of the oxygen, so the brain doesn't work. Um, that's never going to be good. So how are you going to get your breath down? We need to realise what is the blockage. And the blockage is a habit that has often been formed, and it goes back to the age of about two and a half years old where it starts to go wrong. And then by the time we get to adulthood, it's really set in as a strong habitual pattern. And that is to hold our diaphragm. The diaphragm goes all the way around our body. The name of the game with speaking is to 
kick the diaphragm free from its locked position. And to do that, most people think of relaxing. Yeah, you're presenting for your board something really important that you've been walking, working on for a year. Let me ask you, how much of that is relaxing? There's nothing <laughs> relaxing. Why are we aiming to relax? It's about putting the energy into the right part of the body that's useful, which is the lower body, and releasing the upper body. Um, so at kicking the diaphragm through, which is the valve that lets that lower body come in. So I actually use a proactive, active skill, which is the Kapalbhati, which is a yoga exercise. Um, and I've learned this from the best in the world. I've seen the best singers in the world stand beside me and do it. And the Kapalbhati is a breath out because we're focusing on the breath out where the stomach goes in. Notice the amount of shoulder movement. There is a yeah. So, um, and this is a way of kicking the diaphragm free. The breath out, breath out. Stop breathing in, and stop trying to relax in an environment where relaxing is actually not even an objective we should be aiming for. Thank you. Thank you for um, highlighting that as well, because this is really painful, I think, for a lot of people where okay, I'm bringing for anyone watching the video, I'm now starting to bring my hands up onto the screen. But um, for anyone who right. is kind of in a high stress situation, it doesn't make sense to tell your mind to relax. And then you're putting all this energy into trying to relax, which is counterintuitive. And you might feel like you're doing it wrong. I love what you're saying, Louise, about the fact that we actually, it's a high stakes game, perhaps, and there's going to be a lot of energy, but directing your energy to a place where it makes sense, where it's effective, using that energy effectively into the lower body, and then engaging some mm. of these breathing skills coupled with the voice and the body positioning skills. For anyone, again, who's listening right now, get on to the video because you've got to see Louise demonstrating Kapla Body, which is an incredible breathing exercise. I love that that's in use. So you're physically engaging in these breathing practices so that you're essentially, is it that you're cultivating the muscle mm. skills, you know, to relax the diaphragm and then you bring that into these um, more high stakes situations. Release, Release the, diaphragm. the diaphragm. So belly is going yep. out and in. And you know, interesting enough, you, you know, you're in Adelaide, Caitlin, and one day there was a Rinpoche who'd come from Tibet um, with the Dalai Lama. It sent him out and, and uh, we were doing a presentation and he came up to me and he said, that is exactly the work I do. Exactly the same. I, I work on that technique. <laughs> Uh, you know, so it, it, it's, it's kind of we need to go back a bit to ancient cultures and realise that getting the air out, having strategies to get the air out, um, there are a lot of That's them. really beautiful. And we need to use the ones that work. You know, I said if, if you can breathe in and you can relax and those words work for you in that exercise, beautiful, beautiful, go for it, stick with it. But most people, it's not working. How incredible, you know, that ancient wisdom has some of these techniques for us to offer that, you know, in a way there's a spiritual, if that resonates with people, a spiritual practice that can be embedded with, you know, cultivating this body awareness, this sense of being in touch and attuned, you know, this mind, body, voice connection. It's very holistic in nature. It's recognizing that all these parts of ourselves influence one another. You can get a bit weird too and say that once the air begins to flow, it is a common experience for people who perform, especially singers, to suddenly have the feeling as though they're not making a sound at all and people talk about being channeled. It's almost like someone else is making the sound and you're just opening your mouth and it's coming out. You know, we're at, it doesn't happen all the time, but you'll get that. You know, that's what you're aiming for, really, to have that total freedom. And you think about Aboriginal culture where we have the didgeridoo. So that free flowing of air is so important. And from a perspective point of view, we say your air must flow to be trusted and credible. 
Yeah, well, actually, your air must flow to be healthy and unblocked. And the didgeridoo, looking at a spiritual level, is that's so important that people have even learned to do circular breathing. So they never even stop to breathe. The air just continues to flow. You know, our words uh, to breathe, actually, um, psyche, the word psyche actually comes from the verb to breathe. Um, the, the verb personality comes from um, when people wore masks. There was a hole where the sound came out. That's how the actor came to the audience was through their sound. So it was pair sona via sound the actor came to the people, hence the development of the word personality. Our personality is our voice. Um, and uh, inspiration comes from spirare, to breathe. We inspire others. We get air out of our body and into the body of others. Um, it's about inspiration. There's pictures of Jesus connecting to his disciples through his mouth and his voice with the strings. There's a Raphael a painting. Um it's all it there in is, ancient cultures, in ancient it? cave drawings, where they have ways of people connecting. And we touch people with our sound. We touch, we vibrate the skin of the people around us with our sound. We bounce the eardrum, but we bounce the skin all over their body as well. We massage people with our sound. Oh, Louise, that tingles. This is so powerful. And how incredible to see it in various different cultures. You know, the the wisdom of the indigenous peoples around the world, you know, is really conveying the beauty, the healing qualities of sound. I, I feel like we could spend hours and days mm. diving mm. into this. <laughs> As a leader, people stand up and go, "Okay, right now, what we like to look at, uh, and 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 we break, you know, the sound, and we get tight in our resonance, and it's just unnecessary. It's up here for thinking." <laughs> Yeah. And, and it, this is so beautiful too, isn't it? Because I, I suppose what you're kind of conveying to like leaders have this beautiful role where they're conveying information. They can massage the individuals they are guiding with their voice, with their message, which seems to be incredibly fulfilling and nurturing. Or when we kind of get caught in ourselves and our own experience and we get overwhelmed, anxious, you know, very self-focused, I imagine that's much harder for us than to kind of move into that beautiful space you describe of inspiration, you know, of personality. Hard, hard, possible once you know where your blockages are. So personally, I have my unconscious mind here. I actually have it in a solid form and um, I talk to my unconscious mind. So when I'm on stage, I might try and do something that's a block and I say to my unconscious mind, thank you very much. Nice try. Nice so, try. You know, I know you're only trying to protect me and nice try, but not yeah. now. Can I, you know, I just have to describe to people who are listening because oh, you had a puppet on your hand. What, what was that? Was it a shark? I didn't. Um, oh, I've got think ears. It's some sort of bear, but it looks more like a snake. <laughs> so this is, I mean, this is a beautiful visual representation. Yeah, everyone, you just have to come and watch the yeah. video for this one. <laughs> but yeah. So it, it's an interesting point. When I'm working with people, I can actually see uh, a person on their left hand side. I see almost like a sort of a mirror vision of themselves. And when I'm working with people, I'm not working with them. I'm working with this other, you know, we all have our systems, but I'm working with this unconscious mind that is fighting me. And I fought the fight a billion times with thousands and thousands of people. And I know the way it responds. I know how it will try to get around me and try to fool me. I'm up to the game. I've seen it all. I've heard it all. Uh, I know and where it's going. That, you know, you've mentioned that you've worked with so many people. Mm. I am, I'm keen for you to let listeners know where they can connect to you. You know, where, where can listeners find your offerings, your work, you know, your book? <laughs> Well, it's the easiest thing in the world because my name is Louise Marler, M-A-H-L-E-R, and I'm one of the few Louise Marlers in the world. It doesn't sound that unusual, but actually it is. And I am the only Dr. Louise Marler in the world. Um, so how could that be easier to find, Dr. Louise Marler? And I have website, videos, YouTube, 
um, you know, there's there's nothing. Uh, I'm I'm easy to find. And uh, yeah, so louisemarler.com. And listeners, you, it will be in the show notes where as I am. well. Um, Louise, before we do start to wrap things up, I would just love if we could finish off with you describing what, mm-hmm. you know, it means to you to resonate. Like, what does that mean to you? Because I, I kind of get the sense that it's powerful and I don't want to miss this opportunity to ask. Ah, oh, right. You know, I, I have at home a crystal bowl that you can play, play the crystal bowl and you run the striker around it and it Ding, you make a sound and then you run it around and everyone's heard these singing bowls and they magnify the sound and it gets really, it vibrates through you. And we have the possibility as people to resonate in that way, to actually, it goes back to airflow to get the air out of your lungs, through your throat, into your mouth and and magnified with just the effect that you want. And we need to know how to do that because it's not just a matter of communication. Communication is great, but it is a matter of bringing who you are to the world. What is your tone? What is your vibration? What is your resonance to the world? Oh, Let's that's find incredible. It. Listeners, no doubt you feel those seeds of inspiration. Maybe you're feeling that sense of resonance with Louise as well. So make sure you head to Louise's website and, you know, grab her book, her resources, particularly leaders. You know, I think Louise, you so beautifully conveyed that leaders, you know, have this responsibility to lead, to share their message and to essentially pass that inspiration on to the people that they're serving. Thank you so much for your time today. Did you expect that? I did not expect that we would be taking the spiritual turn in this interview. I am delighted by it because I think it is incredible to really honor our voice and to look at indigenous traditions around the world, these wisdom traditions, and to see how voice, how sound is really honored, sacred, and represents connection as well as embodiment. So I hope that this has inspired you and lit a spark in you the way it has for me as someone who has been, um, I guess su- there's been a lot of suggestions <laughs> that I should keep my singing behind closed doors. You know, I am not an opera singer myself, but how inspiring to think that we can learn to use our voice in an effective way to connect, to share. So whether you are leading in terms of your family, your communities, or in the corporate field, this is such a beautiful reminder to develop those skills. And I believe all of us are leaders, right? We want to move into the world in such a way that we can convey and support a world to develop that is kinder, more compassionate, more forward thinking, more sustainable. If we learn to lead with our voice, perhaps we can share our ideas a little bit more easily, a little bit more broadly. And of course, this interview has really highlighted the honor I have the privilege to be dropping into your earbuds today, a privilege that I do not take lightly. So thank you for being here with me, whether it is audio based or perhaps you've jumped on over to YouTube so that you can see Louise's body language in action. Thank you so much for being here. And I look forward to connecting next week. If you would like an email to drop into your inbox to share further thoughts, reflections, wisdom that I'm unfolding in my own life, head to drkaitlin.com and grab resources there, freebies, sign up to be part of the Yoga Nerds. I would love to connect in another forum, a written forum as well. Have a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is that you have created this sacred space for yourself, for your reflection. Enjoy your day going forward. All right. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week on the Wisdom for Wellbeing podcast. Please visit drcaitlin.com to connect find show notes, other episodes, and to subscribe. While you're at it, if you find value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating or perhaps simply tell a friend about the show. Wisdom for Wellbeing is not a substitute for professional, individualized mental health treatment. If you are in crisis, please contact 000, your local emergency number if you are outside of Australia, or attend your local hospital ED.